Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. James this morning. We also welcome some guests, and we thank you for joining us, being here with us to celebrate the first Advent, first of the Advent season, and we'll be serving communion. Here are the announcements. I will start with the fickle pickle breakfast, and that's tomorrow at uh, 8.30. Then we move on to the Friendship Circle Bible Study, and that's Tuesday at 9.30, and it will be held here at the church. Now, number three is the knitting group, and please um, speak to Doris if anyone is interested. I think I have two others. Now the search team will be meeting on December 3rd at 6.30 p.m. And the Presbyterian Ladies Group will be December 4th at 2 p.m. And that's at 6235 Main Street. And that's uh, Lorraine's uh, condo. Okay, one other announcement that's very important at, and that is when you look at your bulletin, the Able Group Network Christmas Lunch, it has nothing to do with St. James, and that's on, the, on Tuesday, December 10th. It's just their celebration that they're having. I will now move on to uh, instead of lighting the Christ candle today, we're gonna be lighting the candle of hope. So let us now get into the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh. The responsive call to worship. Please look at your uh, bulletins and you follow along with me. As we enter the season of Advent, we remember God's call to seek justice in the world God loves. We, we, come. Come. we light the first candle of Advent, a symbol of God's hope, which shines in the darkness. continue. May the light of this candle ignite a fire within your people who are often afraid or hesitant to work for change. And we all say, Holy One, strengthen us by your spirit to commit ourselves to walking with those who are oppressed and marginalized. May our actions reflect your hope which transforms your world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning, everyone. As Craig said to me uh, this morning, happy Christmas, or no, happy Christian New Year. So in the Christian church, this is like New Year's Day, and we begin to tell the story of the birth of the days leading up to the birth of Jesus right now, starting on Advent 1. This is the first Sunday in Advent. So happy Christian New Year. <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, coming today. It's always a delight and, and uh, to come out on a beautiful day like today when we know our friends in Aurelia and Barrie are buried in snow. Uh, we're grateful for uh, clear roads, at least for today, so that is a good thing. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing with regard to the ABLE lunch. Uh, the ABLE lunch, um, following on from what Melda said, is a lunch that uh, Wilma Medley is leading and is providing for the ABLE Network participants and their leaders. Uh, so there are uh, uh, some St. James people who are participating and, and it's going to be a fun day. And it's another way in which St. James reaches out to the community. So we are grateful for Wilma and her team uh, putting, putting on that day. Our first hymn this morning is number 110, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. for a moment come to peace in our hearts and open our hearts as we pray to God let us pray God of love you come to your people to dwell with us you come with power to transform all things you come with promises to make all these things new you come with signs of your deep love for the world. You come, and your truth breaks into our lives, shattering lies and half-truths, setting your people free. Your coming is our hope, and so we offer you our praise and prayers in gratitude and anticipation. Come into our lives again, O God, and show us how to hope in the face of all that is discouraging. For we gather in the name of hope made flesh, Jesus Christ, your promise and our desire. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sins and the sins of this world. Surprising God, forgive our sleepiness in the presence of your splendor. Forgive us when we abandon hope and expect and look for the same old thing in the same old way. Forgive us our silence when we ought to have spoken up, and our carelessness with your world and each other. Awaken to us your holy, hopeful presence as we watch 
and wait. Amen. The one who comes with justice also comes with mercy. The God of judgment is truly the Christ of compassion. God offers you forgiveness this day in the hope that you and I will receive it gladly. Do not be afraid, but rejoice in the God who comes to us. The choir's anthem this morning is, The King is Coming Soon. Let us pray once again. Spirit of God, move within and among us today to open God's word, read and proclaimed for us. Guide us to your truth and help us discern and understand your word, pointing us to Christ, your living word. Amen. A while back, I was thinking out loud, and I said to myself in a moment of exasperation, and perhaps you've had one or two of those, Joan, you're hopeless. My spoken out loud comment was made in the context of me trying in our downstairs meeting room here in St. James to link up my own laptop to a monitor, a new conference speaker phone, and a new webcam in order to host 15 or so people from both St. James and other local congregations in order to show two episodes from that chosen, the chosen TV series. To see those episodes, I had to download a special app onto my laptop. As well, this was a hybrid experience. So I also had to set up a Zoom meeting for those who wanted to join us online rather than in person. Once the Zoom meeting was up and running, I then had to access the episode through that special app and then share it with the online crowd through Zoom. 
And all of this was being attempted with me knowing that our internet service here at St. James is rather poor. We just happen to be located in an almost dead zone. And both Rogers and Bell have told us that there's nothing more they can do. So the task, right from the beginning, of trying to do what had already been successfully done at both Christ Church Anglican and Lemonville United Churches was an uphill challenge. But I was determined to at least try. None of us will get anywhere in life unless we try. In the end, I was able to put it all together and the technology worked, except that the internet failed us. We had to go a different route and have one of those online people uh, show the episode, show it through their internet uh, uh, service, and while those in person at St. James watched it through our own connections here. So it was lumpy and we were late starting both times uh, the participants came to St. James in person. But we got through, it worked. We all watched the show and were able to gather together in hybrid fashion afterwards to discuss it. It was after those two rather traumatizing weeks that I got back to reflecting on my own sense of feeling hopeless. And I realized something. Hopeless was the wrong word. I was perhaps helpless or hapless or an apt, or a technological failure. In church language, we would say that working with multiple technological systems is not my gift. But to say that I was hopeless was not correct. I had hope. That's why I was persisting in trying to make this technology work, because when it works, it can be very helpful and enables us to at least try to keep up with the rest of the world and remain relevant to those around us. Today, we begin the season of Advent, a time of waiting and pondering and self-reflection. Speaking truth to ourselves is high on the list of what is important during Advent. Sometimes it is easy to get caught up in the frenzy of Christmas with that strong push to buy, 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 especially as we come out of Black Friday. Uh, but it is important that we take this Advent time for speaking truth to power, the power being our own ego. That must happen first, because without that, we cannot go before God and speak our truth through confession. This is a one-on-one -on -one experience when we sit alone in a quiet place, go deep within ourselves, and ponder our sins. And I know lots of us don't like that word, sin. But if we understand that the meaning of sin is to miss the mark, maybe it becomes a little bit clearer. Each of us has a huge potential inside of us to be the person that God would have us be. You might say, well, forget that. I'm clearly not in that category. But actually, you are in that category. You are a child of God. And God has great expectations for you, not of you, but for you, and for you specifically. For sure, we know that God loves us, so if we love God, or if we want to love God, acknowledging our shortcomings, our sins, is the first step. It doesn't mean beating yourself up because you're a techie failure. It does mean recognizing and saying to ourselves, Yes, I spoke in anger and said things I shouldn't have. Or, yes, I have great difficulty in relating honestly to that person. And half the time, I don't even want to try. Or perhaps, why didn't I see that coming? I should have understood and taken action proactively, but I didn't. God wants us to be better people, individually and especially collectively in our families, among our friends, and within our congregation, because relationships and being in fellowship with each other are God's top priorities. Love God and love your neighbor. And you can't do one without the other. Think about who, whom you personally most love in all this world. That one soul, and maybe there are many souls you love, but one at the top. 
someone you would die for if you had to. That, a lot of love. And at the center of that love, that feeling of love, lies God, the essence of love. Loving God and each other go hand in hand. Psalm 25 is about seeking God's forgiveness and guidance. It is a personal note straight from your soul to God. Thank you to Melda Francis for leading us in today's scripture readings. As you hear and read this psalm, make it your personal prayer. Now we're reading from Psalm 25, 1 to 10. Prayer for guidance and for deliverance. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the, path, the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant, and his decrees. If you do take the time to ponder quietly by yourself, it can be so helpful if you read the words of others who have taken the time to put deep thoughts and hopes and fears into words. So pick up that Bible and read Psalm 25 to yourself. Read all the Psalms. They capture the full breadth of human emotion. If you noticed, the word shame appeared three times in this 10-verse Psalm. The person praying is asking God to not put them into situations where they will be shamed where they will be publicly exposed for their shortcomings or wrongdoings. And in a very human pushback, the author is asking that any shame they might have to experience be deflected and placed upon those who are wantonly treacherous. In other words, those who are shaming them. It's that human fear of somebody won't like me. When our emotional systems are overwhelmed in shame or anger or doubt or fear, we are to draw closer to God. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Teach us, God. We want to learn. When we forget, we want to be reminded of all that you would have us do and be. We want to get rid of all that negative emotion that keeps roiling around inside of us. And so we go to God in prayer place all of that negativity in God's hands and let it go in humility and in gratitude. We are spiritual people all of our lives. Sometimes I think that children are the most spiritual people of all, but as they grow and experience the ways of the world, they let go of the wonder and trust that they tend to have in everything and everyone. It lies dormant within them unless it is reawakened through the exercise of their own spiritual practices of prayer and praise, fellowship with and service towards others, thinking of others, humility, gratitude, and so forth. We praise and thank God for being that ultimate source of strength and courage that we need daily. 
The psalmist says, you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. There's the sound of hope. Someone who, in full understanding of how they have wandered off the path that God is hoping they would follow, is prepared to wait for that sense of God's presence or guidance to get back on the path. For they know that God is good and has been active in the past and will continue to be active in their lives. And they also know in their heart of hearts about the nature of God, merciful and steadfast in love for each of us. Through our experiences in life, we can learn and mature and get back on that path at the end of which God awaits us. Because all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness, we can and do have hope. We can be people of hope, sharing our hope, our sense of empathy for others, and optimism in the way we face challenges. Hope is the first step on that Advent road, and as Melda said, the first candle that we light. And we are reminded that no matter where we are in life, we remain God's people. By definition, we do have hope, not for our own interests, but for God's presence in our lives and guidance as we stand before God and confess, ask for forgiveness, and go back out into the world determined to live up to the hope that God has for us. As the early Christian church spread beyond the boundaries of Judea, the apostles charged with establishing and nourishing, nourishing them often did so in letters that they wrote when they were away starting another church somewhere else. And the content of the letters often reveals the nature of the problems that those churches are experiencing. Today we'll read a short portion of Paul's letter to the new congregation in Thessalonica, uh, now located in northern Greece. The word hope doesn't actually appear in this text, but all the action verbs convey a very strong sense of hope and confidence that Paul has in the people of Thessalonica. First Thessalonians 3, 9 to 13, Timothy's encouragement, encouraging report. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus, Christ, Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And we all say it together, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you. Do you know for a fact that someone actually prays for you by name? Do they remind you of their intentional focus on you when they come before God in prayer? One of our St. James saints, her name is Eleanor, has shared with me on many occasions how she keeps a list of people and situations that she prays for on a regular basis. Yes, the minister and the elders of this congregation pray for named individuals and for the congregation as a whole. But I'm thinking of others for whom prayer is simply a matter of fact in their lives. Their day wouldn't be complete without it. And they tend to be the most kind and gentle people of all. They want to hear your story, and they want to place your name before God. They really care about your well-being. 
Their focus is not on themselves. And having our focus on others is the way God would have us live our lives. In his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul bends over backwards, figuratively speaking, to thank the people of that small congregation for all the joy that they have given him. His letter gushes with love and support, but you can also read of the underlying problem that he wants to help them resolve. He says he can't wait to get back to them in person so that he can help them restore what is ever lacking in their faith. Paul's letter is likely a response to a letter he received from them outlining the struggles they were experiencing and seeking his wisdom. And remember, these are brand new congregations that the apostles had started, and, and they're filled with people that come from many backgrounds and traditions and ethnicities. And so to, come, to become one as a congregation is an uphill battle. So the struggles that they are experiencing are to be expected. There may be words of complaint, factions, may have allowed to, uh, been allowed to solidify within the congregation. But Paul has words of guidance and wisdom for them. With God's help, they are to increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you, so says Paul. Paul's language is specific and important. The individuals in the congregation are to abound in love for one another for specific individuals, for all specific individuals without exception. Get to know all those people, all those people through trusted relationships, every member in the congregation, and to love them for whom they are. As well, they are to abound in love for all, for the congregation as a whole, for the health and the well-being of the congregation the well-being of the congregation for the community itself is also a pri priority because that's where belonging is centered. These basic principles of congregational life, you might call them, they're just as important for us today and our denomination, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, has retained them and rooted them in mandatory policies and in our book of forms the source of all things related to roles and responsibilities and procedures for handling challenging situations. A healthy congregation is one in which individuals feel welcomed and safe. Relationships are respectable, respective, respectful and positive. Words are kind and gentle. Those are the ways in which we too can abound in love for our congregation. Paul's final words in this portion of his letter provides the larger context for this congregation and for the church as a whole. May God so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Holiness. Dedication or devotion to the service of God. To have a strong sense of the holiness of the God whom we worship will guide us wisely and safely as we continue to serve and love God, each other and all others. I hope that you have great hopes in your life. Hopes for the well-being of those whom you love hopes for yourself wherever you find yourself in life right now, and hope and love and trust in the goodness of God and in God's good intentions for you. I hope that each of us continue to be people of hope, building relationships, increasing the sense of belonging, and trusting in the God of hope. Thanks be to God. Amen. Kelly has an anthem for us this morning, and her anthem is entitled Advent Promise. Virgin 
Let us open our hearts and close our eyes and come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Spirit of hope, when the world is confusing and bleak, you pierce the despair with your word and renew our vision of God's possibilities for our lives. Thank you for lessons learned, for changes of heart and mind, and for new discoveries made and hope restored. As the seasons turn to winter, we pray for those who feel the burden of loneliness and isolation. We remember those without homes to shelter in and those forced to leave their homes through conflict, natural disaster, or political upheaval. Spirit of hope, shelter all these under your wings. Lord, in mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace, the world and our relationships in homes and workplaces and sometimes in congregations are too much filled with conflict, strife, and disagreement. We pray for places where hurtful words, violence, and cruelty appear to win the day. God of peace, work for just and peaceful resolutions to prevail. God of joy, we thank you for moments of joy and celebration in our lives, for pleasure given and received, for quiet times of reflection and conversation, and for the many ways that enable us to keep in contact with those whom we love. We remember those who feel bitter while others rejoice, those who grieve the loss of loved ones, and for those who face a bleak winter for many reasons.
creator of joy, bring to your people warmth and lightness in the season ahead, and let your joy shine through us as compassionate companions. O love divine made flesh in Christ, you call us into communion with you and community with each other. We pray for your church and this congregation that love will guide all your people as we plan for our life and our mission. As we remember before you our families, whether we are close or estranged, and our friends and colleagues who furnish our lives with love, we pray for them all, Lord. Love divine, bless each one with your love and help us express our gratitude and concern for each other in word and action. And now we join our prayers into one voice and pray in the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ's table is set, is set for all. Around it there are no divisions. Just as one loaf is made from many grains, and as one cup is filled from the fruit of many grapes, so we, through ma though many, are made one in Christ. Jesus calls us to this table, and all are welcome here. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The hymn is number 546, Here is Bread, Here is Wine.
him and the Redeemer. And now we rejoice that in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior has come and will come again in power and glory, making all things new. How wonderful are your ways, Almighty God! How marvelous is your name, O Holy One! You alone are God. Therefore, with apostles and prophets and that great cloud of witnesses who live for you beyond all time and space, we lift our hearts in joyful praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only Son, Jesus, to live among us, full of grace and truth, sharing our joy and sorrow. He healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Even when we falter in discouragement or doubt, even when we hesitate to be the people you would have us be, you do not abandon us. You open your arms wide and welcome us home in you. At this table you offer not just bread and wine, but your very self, so that we may be filled and forgiven, healed and blessed once more. Great and gracious God, such gifts touch our deepest needs, and so we proclaim our faith and our hope as we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Spirit of life, rising in us and around us, bless us and this bread and wine. May they become for us Christ's body and life blood, offering new life and the power to make us whole. As this bread and wine become part of us, make us a part of you, God. Dare us to live for justice and joy, trusting that all things will work together for good through the power of the love that raised Jesus from the dead, the love that we share in your name. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus, he thought that Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he took that bread and broke it, saying, this represents my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the very same way, he took the cup, and said, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this blood and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. As Jesus gave thanks to God for the gifts of the earth, so let us give thanks for what we receive from God's hand. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you.
This cup represents the new covenant with Christ. Drink from it, each of you. Christ invites us to join him at this table, to eat and drink with him, and to come to him always. 
as well, Jesus invites us to go out, out into the world, to act with grace, to work for justice, to celebrate God's love with compassion, and to share hope with our community, and to welcome the world with open arms. And why do we do this? Because we have experienced God's love in our own lives, and we want to share this blessing with all others. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal realm. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the awesome power of the Holy Spirit. Our concluding hymn is number 118, Hark the Glad Sound. Christ and Spirit be among you and with you.